You're a marshal. No, she's not. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, we're, we're, we're recording. All right. Uh, I, first of all, thank you again for taking this time on a Friday afternoon. It is April 5th. This is a meeting of the Budget Coordinating Group, a group that includes representatives from Town Council, the Amherst School Committee, and the Jones Library Trustees. The open meeting law allows us to hold this meeting remotely without a quorum of anybody physically present in the meeting location, as long as we provide adequate access, which we are uh, during Zoom and by phone. Uh, given that we have a quorum of BCG present, I'm calling the April 5th meeting to order at 1.32. I'm going to call upon those people that are present and we will continue to monitor for additional people as we move through the meeting. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Uh, present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Uh, Councillor Lord. Present. Okay, and from the school committee, uh, Bridget Hines. Here. Is there any, oh, and Irv Rhodes. Present. And from the library trustees, Bob Pam. Present. Did I miss anybody? I want to also make sure that Sandy Pooler and Jennifer LaFontaine can hear us. Sandy? And Jennifer. Great. Um, we, the superintendent of schools was invited to this meeting. Um, at, I have not received a confirmation one way or another as to whether he plans to attend. And um, I, um, so therefore I am going to ask that we share the presentation that was shared at the council meeting. Um, and Athena, if you don't have it handy, I do. So whatever you would like to do. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm entering. Okay. Now she tells me. <laughs> um, hold on. Uh, you need to give me permission. You're a co-host. Okay, thank you. All right, so this is the budget presentation that was made by the superintendent of schools on Monday night, Sarah Bess, to the town council. Sarah Bess Kenny, uh, the chair of the regional school committee, was also there, and uh, and. Sarah Marshall was there as well. And I do want to note that Sarah Marshall is in the audience. And if we want to ask questions of her, we can bring her in. Um, she is actually not a member of this committee by vote of her body, but uh, we certainly can take advantage of her being here. So basically, uh, this was the general discussion uh, that the superintendent gave us, uh, showing particularly why there's some inflationary issues. I'm not going to read the screen. I'm going to agree that you can all read it. Okay, I'm going to move on unless somebody tells me they need more time. So here, Bob, did you want more time? No. Okay. Um, so here we have basically where the various adjustments were made. The very top uh, of this is adjustments that were made by moving things to other accounts. And then the lower portion is where other adjustments were made. No. Lynn, but we're looking at right now the one that was not voted by the region. Thank you. Correct. This was the one that would come in within the 4% that each of the towns have allocated. 
The school committee, however, then made an adjustment and they added money back in for a total of $941,975. That leaves the level services at 700, I can't read it, sorry, uh, 747,000. Um, that leads to this budget, which is now the budget that the school committee, the regional school committee voted to advance to the town of Amherst and to the other three municipalities. And in this case, it still does not cover what they refer to as their level of services, it's still 747,000 shy of level services, but it does include the 941,000 added back in. And then this actually gets to the issue of the actual payroll and expenses and how that works through. And then this, of course, begins to be the most interesting part, particularly for each of the individual towns, because it begins to show and break out what the cost would be for um, the new budget. And we see a guardrails that moves up to 8.2%. Now, the and then he did talk about capital projects. We can spend some time on that, but I think most of the discussion is really about the operating budget. So Athena, I'm gonna ask that we add this to the packet for today's meeting so that all people can have access to it. Um, did anybody else join that I know? Hi, right, Sharon Sherry, how are you? Um, hey, everybody. Okay. Um, I do want to mention um, that this is what we do know in terms of schedule. Uh, we do know that the uh, Amherst Town Council is going to hold a hearing regarding the budget as required by our charter. And that hearing will be on April 25th at 6.30. It will be on Zoom. Um, um, it will be at five. It's changed. Oh, it's not changed. You're right. Thank you very much. It'll be at five o'clock. And, and, and it's the it, finance committee that's required. It's a the finance hearing. committee hearing, although the rest of the town council is being invited. Um, and then um, the town council itself will vote, but only after we receive a um, recommendation from the Finance Committee, and it is unclear when we will receive that. It could be as early as April 29th, but more likely May 6th or even later. And to just clarify, the Town Council does have up until the end of June to pass our, to vote on the regional school budget. My understanding is that Shootsbury and Leverett are having their town meetings on April 27th, and Pelham is meeting on May 11th. Okay. So with that, I think we have two things we'd like to spend some time discussing, and then we will take public comment. First of all, um, we want to discuss questions about the budget or anything else related directly to the budget. We want to talk a little bit about what we would like to see at our four towns meeting, which is presently scheduled for April 20th uh, at nine o'clock, and then we'll have public comment. So I'm going to go back and look for raised hands. Okay, Councillor Haneke. I mean, this is budget coordinating group. So um, the regional school committee's request 
or voted budget now, not even a request anymore in some sense. They voted a budget 50% or 100% above the guideline increase of 4%. They more than doubled that guideline increase. Um, so I guess in a coordinating group where we tend to discuss how do we deal with the, or how would we distribute the $2.9 million in increase in revenue amongst the four main operating areas, region, elementary, town, and library, and the guidelines are currently equally at 4%. I'm curious um, where the entities believe that double should come from um, if it's going to be an operating budget increase. Should we be decreasing elementary school, general government, and library? Guidelines, um, like like what are what's this group's thoughts on options? And I know we've got a couple of um of our finance staff here. I'd love to see if they've got any if they've done any work on what such a approximately seven hundred plus thousand dollar decrease to the other three major areas, elementary, general government, and library, would look like in terms of staffing and services. Bridget. I think before before we get started into the specifics, and I'm really interested in the specifics, I guess, just as one of the school committee members here who was present for, um, you know, uh, all the people who came forward from the school, our room was overflowing on that night, who spoke about the damage it would do to implement these 14 teaching cuts, and how it would really just affect both the mission of our school district for excellence and our mission of our school difference for inclusiveness to implement these 14 teaching cuts that would have happened if we passed the um, the 4% budget. I just wanted to put forward that, um, that there was just a real strong feeling and, and perspective that we couldn't meet the mission or goals of the institutions of the regional schools if we passed the other budget. I also wanted to mention there are, you know, that 740, it's a, it's still a huge cut to the schools. It's a million dollars total with three quarters of a million in the um, operating and another, the rest in the, um, in the capital budget. So we felt like we really made as close to the bone cuts as we could in the schools, especially in this time of crisis. We all know half the school committee left, none of us, you know, Irv is there, there's a couple people who have done this before, but most of the folks from Amherst are gone, so we're just back at that, and we're going to have a new middle school principal and a new superintendent. We don't want to set them up for failure, especially given the crisis at the middle school. One thing that was really striking to me in all the comments was the, the, with the proposed cuts, with the bullying crisis that we have at the middle school, we would not even be able to have a supervised locker room for the gym classes under these cuts. I mean, and that's against all the AP science, AP this or that. I just want to point out one thing when we talk about sharing the cost. I don't know if any other department has a core staff, in this case, the core teaching staff that would be up for 12% of cuts, but this would mean if you've got 114 teachers at the two schools, it would mean that that staff was being cut by 12%. So I just want to sort of just add that context. I know you heard from other people as well on Monday night, but I wasn't able to be there. So I just wanted to make sure that those pieces behind our reasoning were present as we entered the thing. I think we're looking for some way to share the pain, not just to pass off the pain, you know, so. Bridget, thank you. I want to pause for a moment. Andy Steinberg is on the screen, but he's technically still in the audience. And I want to know, Athena, can you bring him in, please? He's on the phone, but I've renamed him. It looks like he's... Well, I, I allowed him to speak, and that put him on the screen, but it didn't take him out of the audience. Mm, I can't bring in a, a caller as a panelist. Okay. Without, All right. He and, would have had to put in 
the participant. Yeah, okay. sorry, Andy, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So you are showing on the screen on Zoom. And so we will assume that you are in the room and part of the meeting. Um, and if you have, you've raised your hand, otherwise, would you like to go ahead and speak? Okay. I, if I can tell how to raise my hand, I will. Otherwise, I'll just say something. Okay. Right now, your hand is raised. Okay. I can take it down. Okay. All right. Um, Bridget, thank you for that. And Mandy Jo, thank you for your comments about BCG. Are there other comments from people at this, this time? Sandy? Um, since this is BCG and we talk about the needs and planning of all parts of the town, um, I'm going to offer a little bit of perspective on the town side of the budget. Um, and also give you some of my two cents on some of the other issues related to the to this financial situation, if, if I may. Please. So we're in the process of uh, finalizing the town budget with the 4% increase that we uh, had announced earlier in the year. Um, I won't go into any of the specific details about what's being added or so forth, but I will say we're not adding positions. Uh, it's just to kind of cover costs and so forth. So we realize that there are constraints on what uh, we would like to do. We had over a million dollars in requests from department heads for additions, and we've said no to most of them. Um, and I think that is just indicative of the fact that there are always more good things and justifiable things that can be done, that could be done, then there is money to do it. That's just the nature of life under Prop 2.5. Um, so we've stick, stuck within 4% and have, um, have lived within that. I've done some long-term projections for the town. I'd say the town in general has a revenue increase from year to year between 3 and 3.5%. Three and that's the kind of town Amherst is. I mean, if we were Cambridge, it would be a bigger number. If we were Boston, it would be a different number. But that's the kind of town Amherst is. And so I think, uh, in speaking of needs and good programs, you have to keep that in mind in terms of what you say yes to. Um, it is my opinion that the uh, regional school district settled contracts and made other uh, changes that had impact on their overall costs. They mentioned health insurance. Uh, they did not mention what the impact of their contracts are. Um, but for, And I haven't ever seen a forecast of what those contracts would be and how they would impact the town generally. And frankly, I think that's something that's sorely lacking. It's the kind of thing that should have been discussed at BCG um, when those things went into effect. Uh, as opposed to just then presenting a higher budget and saying, give us the money. Um, this is not a unique problem. Across the state, uh, there are many school districts that are facing cuts. We all know about what's going on in Northampton. I read in the Globe the other day that Brookline is going through the exact same thing, and they are making cuts. Uh, so this is not unique to Amherst. Uh, it is a an issue of um, having to balance your desire to provide services against your resources. Um, and uh, I would just say an 8% increase to the town for this. I don't have a source of money for that. Um, in particular, you know, there's just no easy way to cut police officers or library hours or whatever to make up that difference. It's, it's a lot of money. Um, I would also caution against thinking that we could use reserves because then you create as big a problem in the next year as you have this year, but you're already behind by how much you've used for reserves here. You really need to use continuing revenue for continuing expenses. Um, so um, I think that's a situation the town is in from where I see our uh, funds and um, be happy to answer any questions that people have. 
Um, Jennifer or Holly Drake, do you want to weigh in? Jennifer just shook her head no, and Holly stayed on mute, so I guess not. Holly, hi. hi. Go ahead. Can you hear me? We can. Um, I, again, I just want to, you know, mirror what Sandy said. Um, there, there really is not a source of funds without making drastic cuts to the town's operating budget to give um, additional monies to the schools. Our budget, as it is being um, finalized now, is pretty much a level service. As Sandy stated, there is very little money available to um, make any additions and changes. So, um, you know, reserves would be the only option. And reserves, according to our policy, are supposed to be um, for one-time expenses, not continued expenses and operating budgets. So just mirroring what Sandy said. Okay. Um, Irv Rhodes, please go ahead. You know, this is this whole budget this year for the regional schools is a very painful thing. And most of you know that I voted against it uh, and was the only one to vote against it uh, because I couldn't see where the funds were going to come from, from the rest of the town. Uh, and I also know that if those funds came, they would mean cuts in other areas of the budget for other, other town departments. I also realized that this is not a unique situation for us in Amherst or in the schools, because it's happening throughout the state. Uh, but also it's a, you know, it's a part and parcel of the use of ESSER funds when they were available. And those funds dried up and left us with this deficit. Uh, moreover, I believe that um, that there are some structural areas within the regional schools in terms of finances that needs to be addressed uh, in, the, in the very near future. Uh, because this is something that's going to continue to happen. And there are some really uh, hard decisions and also some future planning that needs to take place uh, with the region um, to come to grips with, with the structural uh, financial situation that we're in. And I have proposed, uh, and we'll, it will be on a future uh, agenda, that the uh, school, the regional schools and the four towns come together as they did when we put in the guardrails to look at other ways of coming up with revenue, other possible uh, uh, structural uh, issues that we need to face uh, as we go forward in, in future years. And that's, that is something that really needs to be done. There, the, the regional schools, uh, especially the, the middle school roof, is an incredible problem that could hit us at any moment in yeah. time. And that is something that concerns me on a daily basis. Uh, when you have a roof that uh, partially falls in to a classroom and has to be cleared out uh, by staff, including teachers, that is something that cannot continue to happen. And we cannot just rely on the hope that we will get a grant that will fix that. Uh, and that just, that just begs for crisis management at that point in time. So I have, I have no way of saying to the town uh, in any good way that cuts should be made to other town departments and then have those town departments go through what the schools are going through. And, and believe me, I believe that our kids are a priority uh, and, and that all available resources should be brought to bear on this. But I cannot in all good conscience say, hey, we should do it this year and knowingly know that the following year will be even worse because we will we will have to be dealing not only 
uh, with going forward with this, but also the uh, erasure of the ESSERS funds that is propping up part of this budget this year that will be there next year. Uh, I guess my plea is that uh, the four towns come together to deal with this these structural issue and, uh, and B, that the, the town of Amherst take a closer look at how uh, this budget affects the rest of the parts of the town and to um, look at the uh, future budget, budget years, especially the one following this, in terms of how the town can allocate additional funds for the schools, realizing that yes, it will impact the other areas of the budget, but in my mind, uh, we're going to have to find a way to support the, our kids. And, and we have to do it in a way that is uh, equitable to all the other departments, and find, but still find a way to support uh, our kids. Thank you. Okay. Bridget, your hand is up. and uh, But since you've spoken once, I'm going to go to Andy Steinberg and then come back to you. Andy, your hand is up. I, uh, uh, I appreciate everything that uh, Irv just said. I just wanted to add one additional point that I think that I, we need to think about, but I think all schools in Jesse needs to think about, and that is when you look at how our budget has gone each year before this year, we've always gone into this situation where schools determine what it costs to have level services and then revenue, even at the best of times, was inadequate to reach that point and cuts had to be made. They just were just dramatic in this year's cuts. So the other thing that I think we all need to be thinking about is what the long-term solution is that school uh, increases are greater than revenue increases on a regular basis. Okay, thank you, Andy. Bridget? Well, I, I want to say first off, like, like I do, I fully agree with Andy, like we need a long term strategy and on school committee. I really want us to see us have a budget committee, the budget folks just come out in January and then work on it right away. And we didn't even know what these cuts would mean until until March for the schools. So I feel like there needs to be long term and year round planning on the school committee and especially with a strong focus on revenue. And I even have some ideas for that that I won't get into, but I'm hoping that that building revenue is a big part of the work that we do this year ahead. But I just wanted to clarify something that Sandy said, and I think um, Holly, did they say that you all in all the other departments can fund a level services budget with no cuts or no positions cut? Because for us to, get our level services budget, we have to cut 14 staff members out of the town as a whole, that would be 5%, but from the teaching staff, that's 12%. So I'm just wondering, like, are we the only department that ends up having to like, um, let people go on a level services budget? Sandy, do you want to answer that? Well, I would say that the town, um, does not have to cut positions, but partly that's also because we've maintained our salary costs within the the limits of what we are annually allocated. So uh, we keep our costs down. I worry that what's happened is that the school contract is richer than uh, the town can support without making cuts. And uh, there may have been good reasons for signing that contract at the time, but I don't think that there's been any real reckoning as to what that means. So the town regularly makes decisions from year to year to live within the allocations that it's traditionally gotten and to do that by maintaining the services that citizens expect. I would also just 
like to add, um, I completely agree with what Bridget said about the need for long-term planning. I think um, in all the BCG meetings I've been in since I've been here in the town this year, there's not been any discussion about what the town budget looks like three, four, or five years from now. And I think that discussion really needs to happen to look at what our likely resources are, uh, likely expenses, and um, to have some realistic expectations about what both those things are. Uh, so I think that's an excellent idea. Um, Cindy, in some way, I'm going to build on that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try not to be disjointed. Um, first of all, I think there's no question we would all like to find a good solution, okay? Second of all, we also know that while there has been a um, transition in leadership in the schools at this critical moment uh, when planning could and should have been taking place, um, it didn't. And, but a couple things that really scare me about this, and it, it it is consistent with Sandy suggesting that, you know, we sit and as a group um, sometime in the near future, and we look at what the projections are going out in years to come. I cannot remember exactly whether it's next year or the year after that the teacher contract comes up again for negotiation. And I'm sitting here going, excuse me, yikes because I do know that the one that was negotiated was at least a year overdue when it was finally settled. So it's a three-year contract. It means that people will understandably be looking for increases as well. Um, again, so again, I don't know whether they start negotiations this year or they start negotiations very soon, but. I know it's less than three years away. It's at least within the next two years, if not the next year. The second thing is the predictions that we're getting out of chapter 70, which are horrifying many, many school districts across the state, um, are, they're just not good. They're, they're leaving us all feeling very vulnerable um, and over the half the school districts in Massachusetts are feeling that way. And many of us are letting our legislators know that. And Amherst is clearly among those that are letting people know that. In fact, I happened to be in a room recently with the representative for Pelham, and we talked about it for, because Pelham's one of the um, other contributing towns. The other piece that keeps coming back for me, and that is, no matter what happens, Amherst has to take find the biggest amount of money because we're about 80% of the school districts, of the regional school district's budget. And so I, I don't suggest that Amherst should have more of a say, but I do think that we representing the various boards across Amherst need to have a more common understanding of financially of where we stand. And so Sandy, I um, I may suggest that we have a BCG meeting. We may have to have a BCG meeting anyway, as early as May, uh, because um, of to look down the road, uh, because we don't know where the different town meetings are gonna come in. And frankly, we don't know where the Amherst Town Council is gonna come in. I want to go back to one other thing, though, and I, this is a question back to um, Irv and Bridget, and that is initially when this discussion started, it was the idea that, quote, we would like a one-year gift, and a gift doesn't go to the base, but the way that the school committee voted, it does go to the base, and it becomes the base upon which next year's budget request happens. And so I'd love to have some sense. I'm not suggesting I was ready to sign the check for the gift. I can't do that anyway. Uh, I'm only one vote. 
But at least one of the other scary things about this is it's not just an increase for this year. It's an increase for all the years to come because it goes to the base. And I know this question came up on Monday night at the town council and um, Doug confirmed that it did. And for those of us that have watched the um, assessment method for the last six years, that's certainly our understanding as well. So um, it would be useful for me as a counselor in Amherst to understand what happened to the gift idea and um, not again, making any promises. Thank you. Councillor Haneke, you have your hand. Yeah, um, to follow up on this conversation, a couple of other things that come to mind. Um, we need a plan, um, not just for, as, as Sandy was saying, a townwide plan for all four, I'm gonna say four sort of departments, although there's many within the town department, but the four big ones that generally the guidelines reference. And, and what do those revenues look like and expenses look like and, and how does that affect going forward? But, but one of the concerns I've had is I haven't seen a plan from the region knowing in the last three years, as someone said, it was coming. Um, you know, and I know the last year has been hard for the district in terms of leadership and, and crises and all, but I've been on the council five years and this cliff has been talked about for all five years. So it's not like this is a, a surprise, yet it seems as if the request that is being made to us is because it feels like a surprise to, to the region or something instead of a plan. The other thing that concerns me about um, everyone talking about a plan is they're all talking about a plan for increased revenues. Um, I'm concerned while yes, there might need to be a focus on increased revenues, that, that there is a focus to the exclusive of what can we do to strategize if revenues do not increase. When chapter 70 stays near 0% increases year after year after year, which means the you know state aid is becoming less and less of both elementary and region budgets every year you know and so the assessments have to take on in some sense more and more and that strains everyone you know i i fear there's not a willingness to look at the expense side of planning and and what kind of plan is in place when revenues really can only increase three to three and a half percent a year um, from the assessment side at, in Amherst and all. Um, and then the other question that comes to mind is there was a guardrails put in place. Assessment methods are big, but what what is the plan for four towns when you need four towns to agree to an assessment method and three towns to agree to a budget if and and I'll say if Amherst says we can go up eight percent but the other towns can't you know how, how is is there a plan for if the four towns can't agree or can't come to some some you know sort of compromise or or agreement or whatever um I'd like to see some thought put into some of those things of how does that work? How does, you know, it, it basically how, how does some of that work or what's the thought process of are we aiming for needing all four towns to agree? And if that's the case, each one town in some sense has massive amounts of power to frankly control a budget um at whatever level they want and and i so we need to be talking four towns wise and maybe more than just december and january every year but but we've never broached that potential problem before we've always been able to work it out when shootsbury pushed us to move from a student 
five-year rolling average student assessment method to the statutory method, which benefited Shootsbury tremendously, um, but frankly reduced the funding of the regional schools. If it was on a per student basis, it, it would have had slightly more money every year um, from some of my memory is looking at those charts when we were producing what's a 10% student and 90% statutory and a 50-50 and this and that. Um, when Amherst was kept at its guidance for the town, the regional total budget lessened the farther you got to statutory. Um, the guardrails lessen the budget. And so I'd like to see us be talking about the consequences of those decisions too, as a, as a four towns. And, and just to build on that, we will know in May where we stand. We'll know by maybe even before May 11th. Uh, as to whether or not the regional school committee is going to have to go back to the drawing board. And because if one of the towns uh, prior to Pelham says no, or two towns say no, you're back to the drawing board. And something has to give because you have to pass a budget. Um, we have to pass a budget and with your help, obviously, by the end of June, or you revert to the state method, which my understanding would mean even more drastic cuts starting July 1, because it would be a 1 12th budget of this year's budget. Um, the, and by the way, for anybody who listens to this now or later, this is not easily understood stuff. So please ask questions. Um, a, a regional school district um, is a complicated um, thing. Bob Pam, you have your hand up. I have not over the years been focused on the school budget. So I'm, when I say may or may not make any kind of sense to you, um, I am aware that, that the governor has just imposed a hiring freeze um, at the state level because um, the governor, the, the state budget has issues. Um, the question is, it is now April. Um, there's not a whole lot left to this school year or to this fiscal year, um, but whether there is going to be any possibility of some savings there, which then gets rolled over. I don't know exactly how the budget works for the, the school budgets. Um, on, a, on a longer term kind of question, um, there are two things that just casual reading of the newspapers you know, has occurred to me. One has to do with the, the millionaire tax, which was imposed, but which, as I understand it, the governor and the legislature has essentially focused on higher education rather than on elementary and secondary education. And that would seem to me to be one of those areas where rather than talking about uh, additional money that is not currently available, uh, it becomes a question of how much of the addition which is expected to come from that uh, could be available for elementary and secondary education. The second is that in a, a previous life, I remember that that special ed has consistently been underfunded at, at larger levels, at, at the federal level and the state levels, um, and the question is whether uh, providing more on those particular issues uh, would be more easily addressed at the state level than other kinds of issues. Um, obviously, there are the things that, that we have talked about over the years, which have to do with transportation, all of the things that, that make it more expensive to do in Western Massachusetts than it is elsewhere. All of these are perhaps part of a longer term discussion, um, but it it just seems to me that that these are kinds of things that that probably ought to be at least on the agenda for for discussion. Um, Bob, we can add to the list and many people have, and that is that Amherst pays a whole lot more 
for students to go to charter schools than our next door neighbors because it's based on our per pupil cost. So we're paying close to $20,000 a student to go to a charter school. And our next door neighbors are paying around 10, I think. And it's because that's, there's something broken about that formula. And yet there are people in our town and other towns who want to make sure charter schools continue. The other piece is that as, even though charter schools are required to provide special ed services, they don't provide them at the level that the town of Amherst does. And so when kids have special needs, they're frankly much better off remaining in the public school than going to a charter school, which again, our, our bill for the charter school this past year was over 2 million. Right there's the 1.7 you're looking for. Um, so it's there's got to be something where the state and and we regularly and whenever any of us meet with our state representative and senator, uh, we regularly these these issues are on the list, but they're not going to get solved this year. That's the problem. They're not going to get solved in order for us to deal with this budget. So are there any other comments at this time? Mandy Jo, I mean, sorry, Councillor Haneke. So, so we've been talking a lot about the region budget, um, but I fear looking ahead to FY26 that the elementary school budget might be facing some similar difficulties because of its use of ESSER funds in the FY25 budget. Um, the planning that needs to go on at the region, I would I, I would really like to see also at the elementary. I know there's some stuff coming, like a new elementary school that will save on utilities and all that that could result in or should be resulting in some savings such that difficulties in an FY26 budget for the elementary school might literally only be one year. I don't know, but I think those projections out four or five years need to be done for the elementary schools too, given that in FY27, there's going to be a huge change in services because of a consolidation of schools and the opening of a new school that is net zero and com combining you know, staffing into those schools and more efficiencies that way. I think it's just as important to be doing that planning for the elementary school. Um, and, and since I don't want to leave the library out, the library's got a building opening in FY27 too. So I think this, this five-year sort of planning out for revenues and expenses could be very healthy for all four areas to be doing, given the changes that are coming. But you know, I, I don't want to be faced next May with an elementary school that asks for more than an elementary school budget that asks for more than 4% or 3% or whatever guidance might be next year to get them through a year and be begging for the same sort of planning documents that we're begging for now for the region. Bridget, with your um, agreement, I'm going to go to Sandy to see if he has a response to that and then come back to you, Sandy. Thank you. Actually, I, I don't have a response. I will very quickly say what I wanted to say and just put on the table. I think one of the questions about long-term planning that people have asked me about the school budgets and about the potential reduction in staff is that you have declining enrollment. And so in some sense, it makes sense that you would have fewer teachers this year than you had last year or than the year before. And uh, I think in thinking about what a long-term budget for the region and the elementary schools is, the question about the effect of declining enrollment on staffing needs to be answered. Thank you. Bridget? So I'm going to just throw out a couple things that maybe like speak back to the question. I think one reason that we didn't ask for a gift is because looking ahead already, at the inflation numbers in that year's budget, they're looking at 1.9% for the state chapter 70 funds, which are nowhere near sort of like what we're getting. And we're afraid that the gap for next year, if we don't 
have a bigger base right now is going to be about 2.5 million. I did want to talk about something related to enrollment. I can just use the middle school as an example. The middle school has gone down um, from eight teams to four teaching teams. And um, in that same time that the that the teams, the teaching staff have literally gone down by half, the school population has only gone down by, I'm not exactly sure, but it's somewhere about 10 to 12%. So when we see problems like we're seeing at the middle school, I think the teachers came to us and are really like, not only is the quality of education suffering, and some of these solutions that you're proposing with the cuts we've tried before and they were a miserable failure. But they're also saying that um, like just the basic tenets of being able to supervise kids in a way that they're safe when you're cutting that many teaching staff was, was sort of a big thing. I wanted to talk for a minute about the other towns like Hadley, we know they have a different foundation or fiscal base, but they just passed no budget cuts Chicopee on the contracts, they had to do mid-contract raises because there's such a teaching shortage right now. So we're just, I think all I'm adding are just like more details to understand why the schools are in such a difficult fiscal place. We have surrounding towns like Belchertown or Northampton where their percent of the town budget is higher. And it makes me think about like equality versus equity, like this 4% idea for every department that's an equality-based idea, but if we really value education, we've got like uh, three police officers per 100,000 or per 1,000 residents, but one guidance counselor per 240 with these cuts, which is like right at the level that you could get federal grants for under-resourced schools. Like we're really just cutting to such a big point that um, that it's that it's short-sighted from an enrollment perspective to make these schools. If we've got these cuts, we've got the robust elementary language program and then very minimal language and minim middle school out of these cuts. Like people, I had eight families come to me looking at these cuts and just be like, we're not gonna come to the middle school if it's that. So that's all money then we're gonna be sending out a district. And um, I'm just like trying to, put a little context into the room because I think what you all are saying is really important. And um, one idea for revenue is to try and get some of those IRA funds because we've got $604,000 in electric and gas for the two buildings. And there's federal money on the table right now that could help our operating budgets year after year. But to come and make the cuts at the teacher level um, it's just really going to be devastating. I can't, I can't underestimate what we heard at that series of meetings or what people are coming to us with. So I just want to make sure we're clear with that and think, how can we be more equitable across departments, you know, um, so that we can say as a town, we value education. We can't just say it. We have to actually be able to mean it or provide it to. And I just love to be in these long-term conversations because I do see a lot. I've been through the budget like line by line. I see a lot we could do, but this current budget just isn't sustainable for the schools. Other comments? Mandy Jo, I think you, I don't see your hand. Oh, you just changed positions on my screen all of a sudden. So I assume your hand must have gone up. Andy, your hand went up. Yes, uh, I was thinking about a couple of things that have gone on in the conversation that I've heard. One of the things as far as long-term planning is we, and this is painful because I spent 17 years of my life on it, we got nowhere, which is um, we're not necessarily an efficient region by being a region with different elementary schools. That we would probably, I mean, almost certainly be more efficient if this was the K 12 region. And uh, Shrewsbury shot it down when we did it uh, a number of years ago. And then sort of, a, and then we tried it once with Pella, 
connected for work either. So there is a conversation that may need to take place if we're really thinking about a long-term solution. And it may be something that Amherst needs to raise when there's a the next four-town meeting, which is why it's worth bringing it up with the Amherst group. And the other thing that I was just uh, reflecting on as we've had as I've been listening is that as a member of the um, MMA Fiscal Policy Committee, and, you know, these are discussions that we are having on that level too, and it is not easy to solve because, like everything else, there are winners and losers in every discussion, and uh, when we talk about how our district and some of the other districts are suffering so badly, and, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of it's part because of the uh, Student Opportunity Act, and, uh, you know, the Student Opportunity Act uh, districts really suffering to provide the kind of education that uh, a lot of other districts are providing, which is why... Uh, the legislature went in the direction of uh, instituting the act, um, but it does have everything that we do as consequences somewhere else. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't know if Sandy has any experience or this is far longer service on that committee than I've had, but I just don't see that it's, uh, you know, it's uh, hopeful. Uh, that we're going to be able to get to the solution very quickly. And the problem is that we're in a crisis that calls for a quick solution. So, uh, anyway, those are the things that I was thinking about as I've been listening. Um, I'm trying to raise my hand so that I can recognize myself. Um, what I'm about to say is not meant to be critical of any one individual, but Amherst voted at a huge percentage, I think second in the state for the millionaire's tax. And recognizing that we have one public higher ed institution in Massachusetts in our Commonwealth uh, in our, you know, in town. Uh, I'm sure some of that would have been support for that. My personal observation about the millionaire's tax is that it's being used by many for additional programs, not to support the basic programs that we already have and that really need these funds. And that's a terrible thing and a tough criticism to make. The one thing that they did for schools was lunch, the free lunch program. And while I understand the importance, absolutely the importance of food on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it comes only right under shelter. Um, but the reality is I'd be more than glad to pay for a couple of kids' school lunches if they would just put it toward the basic core functioning of our budget. And I'm sorry to be so critical. <laughs> Are there other comments? I'd like to spend a little time talking about our expectations at the Four Towns meeting. So the Four Towns meeting is scheduled for the 20th of April. That is before our finance committee meeting will have recommend, made a recommendation. It's also before any of the town meetings will be held. Uh, one of the questions that uh, has been raised uh, by the schools who actually convene the meeting is whether or not we want to meet in person or on Zoom. And one of the reasons to meet in person is because there's always the desire that uh, we will caucus and somehow or another miraculously come out of the caucus with a unified response that we're willing to share. 
And yet, at that point, I don't think any of us will feel we have any right to make any statement on behalf of anybody that we belong to about the budget that in some way would sound like a unified answer from Amherst. But that's just my tough opinion about trying to have a unified caucus statement. The only unified caucus statement that I can imagine is our finance committee has not made a recommendation and therefore the council nor the school committee can act. I still think it's critically important for us to have a four towns meeting, but I'm not clear that a caucus will gather anything. Mandy Jo or Councilor Haneke? So I am torn about all of this. April 20th is the last Saturday of April break. Mm -hmm. When so many families are not even in town. So I actually fear that an in-person meeting will have less attendance than a Zoom because many people will probably have to be attending by Zoom. Actually, it's Google. Um, you right. know, I, I personally cannot attend in person that day. I need a phone number I can call into to be able to attend. I will be in the car at that time because it's so late scheduled and I have other commitments. But, you know, that, that I'm just one person. But given when it was scheduled for, uh, I think it's already going to be hard to get a good representation of the four towns present. Um, and if you put it in person, I think it's going to be even harder because I actually think um, many people will be out of town. Mm -hmm. um, and then the caucusing, I've found that it's helpful, but it's never long enough um, mm -hmm. to really get a good conversation in. So while we've lost some by not being able to caucus, I'm not sure we've lost much. Okay. Thank you for those observations. Irv. And given what Mandy just said, in terms of the four towns meeting and the impact of, uh, of the, of the uh, school break uh, and the possibility that there will be, we're, since it's going to be in person, that a lot of people would not be able to attend. I mean, is it possible to reschedule this meeting? Because that, this is a critical meeting. Uh, that needs to be uh, needs to be had. I I do know that different schedules were looked at uh, by uh, the um, superintendent and so forth, and this was the date that was chosen. We can certainly go back and ask. Again, I also observe that this may not be the last four towns meeting we're going to have to have. This year because i mean this calendar this uh, fiscal year because depending on the outcome of um the different town meetings and the amherst town council vote um you know we may have to have yet another four towns meeting sometime in april in may so i i i am hearing don't i i'm hearing Absolutely do it virtually. That's number one thing I'm hearing. Second of all, I'm hearing so far, but now I want to hear from others, that the concept of caucus doesn't necessarily gain a lot. Bridget? So I can't speak for the superintendent, but I did hear two things. You know, so this is hearsay, but mm -hmm. the information that the superintendent provided about the date was that this was the date that it had to be on um, related to the town meeting schedule of the other towns. And so I think that that's why we have it here. And the mm -hmm. second piece is that I know, or I heard that the superintendent's very much in favor of being able, of us having just more um, more latitude and more wiggle room if we have it in person. So I I think that those are the reasons behind the decisions that, that we're looking at to have it in person preferably thank and to have it on that date. No. Thank no. you for sharing that. Um, Sandy and Jennifer and Holly and I will go back and um, have that conversation um, with Dave Zomack, who's the interim, inter, interim um, town manager right now. Uh, it's also, however, I, I just want to point out that it is at least our practice for the council and I think for uh, the school committee as well, as well as Jones 
library, and that is that we like to provide access for people to be either in person or on Zoom. So we would hopefully want to do the same in this case. So people like Councillor Haneke can still join us, um, even though she can't be, quote, physically in a room someplace. Um, so, and, and there are different platforms allow different things, but no platform uh, that I'm aware of allows you to actually, it, Zoom allows you to break into groups, whether it allows you to caucus in a way that the caucuses are open meetings is the problem. Because <laughs> you can't, um, anyway, that's my understanding of the technology at this time. Um, just, uh, very quickly, um, I want to just look at something cause I wrote down a few other questions, uh, about this particular event. And it's my assumption that the superintendent will make a presentation of the proposed budget, uh, and the assessment amounts as well as the capital budget and the assessment amounts, um, and other than that, I really have no sense of what is planned for that meeting. Um, are there any other any other feedback about the meeting that anybody would like to add? So if there is a group in person, there, there needs to be a Zoom option. There is no question about that. Okay. Um, if not hearing anything else, I'm going to go to public comment and ask if there's anybody in the audience who would like to make public comment. Please raise your hand. Okay. Um, I need to ask the person who is the last uh, numbers on the phone or 0810 to please identify yourself and where you're from, and then we'll proceed. Yeah, um, Vincent O'Connor, I'm from Amherst, uh, 175 Summer Street. Please proceed, Vince. Okay. Um, I wanted to just ask a question, whether the um, the meeting of the finance committee this Tuesday passed uh, immediately passed was considered to be the finance committee's public hearing on the regional school budget. Uh, Vince, it was not. That hearing is scheduled for April twenty fifth at five o'clock. It will be on Zoom. It is a hearing held by the finance committee, but all town councilors will be welcome to join in it. And um, it's only by Zoom? It is going to be only by Zoom. It's the finance committee meetings. They are only held by Zoom. There, there was a question on Tuesday as to whether it might be hybrid or not. And so I believe our chair is going to consult with Athena on potential options. Got okay. There. So I'm not sure a full final decision has been made on that matter. Thanks, Mandy. Joe. Um, Vince, is there anything else that you'd like to state at this time? Um, yeah, I, um, I would, I just like to say something about the regional budget. Um, there were comments about how the, the, the budget, the school population has decreased by one half, about 50%. And I, I didn't hear a response that said what, what I know, which is there used to be four teams in the middle school and there are now two, which seems to me to be, at least mathematically, um, an appropriate reduction. I mean, it may, the, the reduction may have had the impact a greater impact than 50%, but um, in terms of making reductions, um, at least at the middle school, and I, I because it's the high school is more complicated. Um, my rec, you know, my understanding is that the middle school has uh, staffing has has 
been adjusted to meet the decline in school population. Um, and the other, the other thing comment I'd make is that um, I think that there needs to be some awareness that the the regional school and, and the elementary schools face competition. This is not a, a matter that that is is an issue with other aspects of the of the budget um, that are that the council considers. Um, but both of these schools face competition from private schools, charter schools, school choice. And additionally, the regional school faces competition from um, tech school. Um, and, and, the, and the tech school competition is such that the, the loss, the, the payout, um, is almost identical to that um, that happens with charter schools, about $20,000 a year. And so mm -hmm. the reductions that have been made in the past are, are one of the reasons we have these level of payouts. And I think um, what may seem financially wise could could in fact turn out. I mean, in 2018, the the, the child care program, which served both faculty and uh, people in the surrounding community, needed $25 worth of $25,000 worth of financial support to add to the, the tuition that the the families whose children were taken care of um, paid, and um, that was that was turned down, and I think it's those kind of decisions that really have created, you know, are, and are creating and making worse problems with the regional school, um, and its and its attendance levels. And I I just I would urge people to uh, to understand that one there is competition, and two that. That competition has financial impact on the town. We pay out, and if if we are not wise in our decision making, um, we could create more problems than we think we're solving. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Just I'm normally don't do this, but it was redu reduction of eight teams to four teams, not four to two. Okay. Um, your point is still made, but the number right. was. I mean, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there any other people who would like to make public comment? Okay. Are there any other comments from the group before I ask for a motion to adjourn? Okay. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn and seek a second, and then we'll okay. actually take a roll call. Thank you. Um, so we've had a motion to adjourn. It's been seconded. Uh, when I call your name, please indicate whether you agree with that by saying aye or nay. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Lynn Griesmer's an aye. Bob Pam. I think that was an aye, but I had to read your lips. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Bridget Hines. Aye. Irv Rhodes. Uh, Councilor Lord. Lord, I. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.